Welcome to episode 62 of Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Azgari. And today we continue our 1940s run with The Heiress from 1949, which won four Oscars on eight nominations at the 2020 at the 22nd Academy Awards. Uh, the reason we are doing this film, the reason we chose it is because uh, back way back on episode 16, we covered Hamlet from 1948. And that ended up being one of my favorite episodes we've ever done on any podcast because it gave us four movies. Uh, you know, you, you take, take Hamlet away. The other four movies that were up for best picture that year are really fucking good. You know, uh, red shoes, treasures, of the Sierra Madre, uh, Johnny Belinda and snake pit snake pit of course features a awesome performance from Olivia de Havilland. And we both were kind of like, wait a minute. Who's this, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who's this? And, and about a year ago, she passed away. Um, she was one of the last remaining, you know, icons of this era. And she's definitely missed, you know, her, her talent was amazing. She lived a very long life, worked, worked for like 50 years straight. So she, she just is, is very important to kind of our conversation and what we care about here on Oscar Sunday. So to do an episode based around a win just made sense when we go to the forties, you know, last week we got to talk about Charlie Chaplin, which is something we talked about on a previous episode. We wanted to kind of keep that theme going of things that we are inspired by. Let's take it further. And Olivia is just captivating as hell. And I don't know, I don't have a lot of opinion on the competition, but I can't see how someone could outshine what she's doing in the heiress. Yeah. It's quite a uh, powerful performance. Um, I had, texted you about uh there's a certain air that films uh in the first half of the 20th century have you can kind of see that they became the building blocks of future hollywood films that these became films that would inspire so much other cinema and the heiress is definitely one of those films you can see that and a lot of that is owed to her performance as you know, her evolution from kind of an emotionally neglected heiress to a strong, independent, kind of loveless woman who's kind of become, she becomes her father, essentially. And it's, you can just, you can see the little moments in her performance that transform her. And that is really impressive. Yeah. It's something to behold when uh, you can, you can do that inside two hours. You're just, just fucking transform. And it reminded me of so many performances that I've kind of fallen in love with over the, you know, over the years of just watching movies and you kind of have to tip your hat to the people that just did it first. You know, you have to give them credit. And I think Olivia just ha- has an ability to kind of turn, yeah, turn, turn on a dime. And she also has, can also turn slowly and, you know, kind of the slow burner. The heiress certainly starts out kind of like, uh Oh, what is this? Is this just another uh, just run of the mill? Like, what's the big deal? 40s movie. But no, no, it really, it really blew me away. I'm really glad I I, I own this movie. And I I actually, I'm packing right now because I'm about to move. And uh, I had accidentally put it in a box. Well, that was stupid because you cannot find the heiress anywhere. You know, you can't, there's nothing you can do. You can't watch it anywhere right now. (laughs) You can't even find it to rent on Prime and and Vudu. Uh, I. I was going to do that because I was so lazy to open the box back up. I was like, oh, I'll just fucking rent it. Uh, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't do it. So um, very frustrating. I see here on IMDb, you have to buy it uh, for eight, eight fucking dollars on Amazon. So that's the only way I guess <laughs> you can do it. It is, you know, I, I bought the Criterion edition. It's a beautiful case. I, I've been wanting to watch it ever since I've got it and finally broke it out of that stupid box and, put it on. I was, I was very happy with our choice here. Uh, you know, with the, with the forties, it can be hit or miss. We've seen that happen. You know, with, uh, w- when we did Hamlet, we were like, damn it, you know, yeah. but it, but it, it gave us, it gave us some other golden stuff. So, uh, I, I'm very happy with it now w- with this show on Oscar Sunday, you know, uh, what we like to do is talk about the individuals that make up the film. So, you, you know, we're, we're going to bring up, fucking William Wyler. We're going to bring up Olivia again. We're going to bring up Montgomery Cliff. That's going to happen. But I I wanted to start the show with a little bit of fun here. I wanted to kind of get the, get, you know, get the gears going uh, and kind of see 
where you're at with some of the best actress wins that we've kind of talked about on this show over the past 60 episodes. So what, I, what I've done here, uh, if you've listened to us before, you know, we like to just occasionally spice it up a bit on our Toy Story episode. Uh, Caleb joined us, Caleb Leger, uh, and we did a bracket of all the Pixar films that we've all seen, you know, and we kind of voted on them. Well, here I, uh, you know, used your handy dandy letterbox and I see that you, you have seen 33 best actress wins. You've seen 33 performances over the, you know, that's, that's like, uh, that's like 33%, you know, it's close. It's somewhere in there. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, you, you've seen, you've seen quite a bit. Uh, I I'm, I'm right around the same. I think I've seen 35. There's just a couple more that I've seen. Cause, and I can kind of point them out, you know, like Clute, Jane Fonda, one that I know you're going to get to one day, uh, a movie I love. Uh, so that that's, that's going to happen, you know? Um, now 33 is a, is a pretty big number. And I was looking at them and I was like, wait a minute, a lot of these we have brought up on this show or sometimes based an episode around this movie. So I found basically 16, which makes up a perfect bracket, 16 um, performances. So I have them randomly thrown in here that I, I used a uh, randomizer.com uh, great website. If you're just trying to do something fun like this and I, I just threw them down in here. So I want to kind of, Go through each one. Uh, you'll just be voting for each one. You know, um, I, I have them randomly, so I think that some of the matchups will be really weird for you. You know, be. But we have talked about all of these on this show, so that's that's the kicker, and we can talk about when it came up uh, and, and whatnot. So, uh, you want to get started or what? Hell yeah! This is awesome. I did not expect this at all. This is great. Yeah, uh, I like preparing something. I honestly was starting to do this before I watched the movie. Cause I was like, well, maybe the movie's boring and <laughs> you never know. You just never know. And I, I want to have something in the back pocket, but I, I like this idea so much and I want to shout out all these women because fuck it. Why not? You know? So uh, let's, let's, let's start this nice and easy. Um, let's go ahead and the woman of the hour, Olivia de Havilland, let's start with her. She's matched up uh, with her performance in the heiress against Meryl Streep in the iron lady. Now, that's a 2011 film. Uh, we definitely brought that up at some point when we did Moneyball. Uh, I know we brought it up a bit when we did uh, when we were swapping performances and stuff like that. I think we did that on a sneak preview, maybe. I don't, we, we've definitely talked about this role yeah. a few times because I know that you have issues with it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get into over 60 episodes about an Oscar-based show without talking about Meryl Streep at least once. Exactly. Um, well, the thing about the heiress versus the iron lady, the iron lady is a bad movie that happens mm. to have a semi decent, I don't think Oscar worthy performance by Meryl Streep within. So I'm going to go the heiress. Yeah. Yeah. I think that one's pretty easy. Uh, the way, the way that one lined up now, Meryl Streep, absolute, you know, legend, you know, uh, a three time winner. She has the most nominations ever for an individual. She's just uh, uh, an absolute beast <laughs> when, it com when it comes to the Oscars. Uh, now, I, I know when you see Sophie's Choice, you'll be like, ah, yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, that feels good. And of course, we've talked about Kramer versus Kramer, but that's a supporting uh, role. She won the Oscar for that alongside Dustin Hoffman. Uh, awesome movie. 1979 will get brought back up. Uh, so Olivia de Havilland, easy win there. She will move on. Now let's go with, uh, let's go old school against new school. Um, let's do, it happened one night, Claudette Colbert and Brie Larson in room. Oof. God, you could not pick two more polar opposites. Like yeah. funny versus just sad as hell. <laughs> yeah. This is the randomizer.com. That's why I love it. Oh, okay. Claudette Colbert, it happened one night is bouncy, funny, kind of a smart ass but ultimately lovable. Brie Larson in Room is fantastic, just dealing with an absolute nightmare of a life. And I think... Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, this is tough. This and, is you got, and, 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 you know, you have the big five winner kind of behind it happened one night of yeah. just this huge Oscar movie. And Room is one that just kind of, aside from Brie Larson, kind of, 
went under the radar, you know, but it's a solid, solid flick. I think in It Happened One Night, I do think Clark Gable outshines Claudette just by a bit. I think his character is a lot more transformative in that from just, you know, snarky reporter looking to make a buck to caring individual. Brie Larson in Room has no (laughs) equal. (laughs) I'm going to have to go Brie Larson on this. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally fair. Uh, she, she is, you know, Jacob Tremblay is doing every, everything he can do, but Bree is really carrying this movie with, with a, a grace that's well, just like else. she has to be a strong mother who is protecting her son from the nightmare reality that they've been trapped in a box for a decade. Yeah. Oof. And she has to keep that from completely shattering her because she has to be strong for him. And that performance is so layered and powerful. And she definitely earned that Oscar. And yeah. I wish more people talked about that movie. It kind of just like after 2015, people stopped talking about it. She really proved that she is somebody to, to watch out for. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think I think that is a clear turning point. Of, oh, she can, she can probably do anything, you know? And then, and then we see her, you know, show up in Marvel and fucking Kong Skull Island. She, she's able to do kind of, kind of everything in Hollywood. So yeah, she's, she's awesome. Going to be around for a long time. Um, let's go up to, uh, here's a fun one. 1964 versus 1996. Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins versus Francis McDormand for Fargo. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> In 1964, of course, we talked about one of our favorite Kubrick movies, uh, Dr. Strangelove. Talked a lot about other 1964 films. Uh, and for Francis McDormand, we based an episode around Fargo and really, really talked about her most of the time. You know, it was, it was around when Nomadland, we figured she's probably going to win. You know, she's going to go into a stratosphere yeah. with three wins that, you know, she just has put herself in a special place. <laughs> and lo and behold, we were right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was a great performance. <laughs> Fucking fern. <laughs> oh, this is a fun kind of you know blast from the past, almost like a greatest hits thing. This is yeah. fun. Um, okay, so Mary Poppins is a film that's been with me since I was a kid. It's super special. Reminds me of my grandma, and weirdly, so does Fargo because she loves that movie too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh man. So you got it. All right. You got to take the movie out of it because Mary Poppins versus Fargo. I could, I can't do that. So I guess. Yeah. Well, I know, I know Mary Poppins is like a, 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 a 10 for you. Yeah. And, and Fargo is a nine. Yeah. Oof. So, so I got to just take Julie Andrews versus Francis McDormand in this film particular. We got. <clears throat> okay. So Julie Andrews is Mary Poppins is a decent performance. It's not. All, I personally don't think it's that different from Julie Andrews herself. She seems mm. like that kind of person. Whereas Marge Gunderson is one of my favorite female protagonists in a film. And I love every second she's on screen. I got to go Francis McDormand in Fargo. Yes. <laughs> Fran. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I would have done the same thing. Uh that 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 is you know that along with the dude and and walter those are the most iconic cohen characters and i think you could throw hi in there uh those are massive massive pop culture you know people that we just always talk about you know a character like marge is always going to get always going to get brought up so yeah Mc, mcdormand's McDorm- she she's a legend you know at this point she's just stacking them up and seeing what she can do uh, for her legacy when it comes to the Oscars. But she doesn't seem to really care about that, which is why it works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Here's, here's a gritty one. Uh, Ingrid Bergman in Gaslight, which we did an episode on versus Natalie Portman in Black Swan, which uh, Black Swan was brought up on an episode where you, you kind of watched all the best picture nominees and kind of, that was one of them that you had to kind of catch up on. And uh, I I remember talking about it, you know, it's Darren Aronofsky. It's a best, you know, best uh, actress 
performance that you know you were gonna you're gonna watch at some point anyway. So it was it was fun to be able to do that through the show. Um, who do you got? Ingrid versus Natalie. And, and this was entirely randomized by some website. Yeah, randomizer.com. Because those two are so similar that it it works. It's you know just men driving women crazy. Yeah, that's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and then you have like the the weird Claudette versus Brie. You know, like what? <laughs> it's perfect. Oh. All right, so Ingrid Berman and Gaslight was such a cool performance, and that was a really cool movie. Uh, very much a mystery. Uh, Natalie Portman in Black Swan is a difficult film to wrap your head around if you're not really, really paying attention, which is kind yeah. of Aronofsky in, in general. Yes. And I've never really been that big of a Natalie Portman fan, to be honest. I think she's good in Black Swan. I'm okay with her winning the Oscar, but I fell in love with Ingrid Bergman's performance, so I'm going to go Gaslight. I like it. Ingrid Bergman, uh, another Titan. I think she has seven total nominations, performance nominations, and, and three wins. Yeah, she's just... Yeah, she's, she's fucking dynamite, so I, I was really happy to be able to talk about her on that, that episode, 1944. Gaslight, check out that film. Check it out. It's really good. One of my favorite 40s movies for sure. Uh, let's see. What can we do next? These are good. These are real good. Oh, boy. Uh, let's do a 70s matchup. Oh, Jesus. Uh, 1976 versus 1979. So 1976 was brought up a long time ago. Uh, I want to say episode three when we talked about Rocky. Yeah. Ro- Rocky, best picture winner. Beats, you know, fucking Taxi Driver beats Network. Uh, what else is in there? It's like a really good group. All the president's men. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. What a good group. <laughs> the seventies, <laughs> the seventies. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know what the fifth one is. I, I know I watched six. I know I watched it. Yeah. We watched them all. I, I remember at that time we were like, let's just watch everything we fucking can <laughs> and, oh. and, and jump into this and, and network. That was our first time seeing network. Oh, uh, bound for glory. I didn't watch it. <laughs> Oh, okay. That was, that was, we, we have skipped here and there. We've skipped uh, maybe one movie out of the group here and there, but not anymore in best picture showdown that oh. we have to, we have to rank them. So <laughs> we can't do that anymore. Um, so yeah, 1976 network, awesome film. Faye Dunaway. We love her. We talked about her a lot on the Chinatown episode, 1974. She is fucking spectacular. I kind of wish she would have won 1974, but the win in 76 is great versus 1979. Our, our beloved Sally Field and Norma Ray as Norma Ray. <laughs> that, was, um, that was our first ever official Best Picture Showdown where we really took it seriously. Uh, looked at the 1979 movies, watched all five. Uh, let's see if we can remember those. All That Jazz, Kramer's Kramer, Apocalypse Now, Norma Ray, and Breaking Away. Good work. <laughs> yes, there we go. It's a good year. It's hard it to is- forget when, when yeah. you get five legitimate movies. Uh, I had no problem with watching any of those. I was like, this is great. This is, this is so much fun. And it was great to talk about Kramer vs. Kramer because I love that movie. But Sally Field just kind of punched us in the face. We were like, wait a minute, what have we been missing here? You know. And we were able to cover her again on Places in the Heart. I don't have that one here because I didn't want to have two Sally Field performances. Uh, so I chose Norma Ray because I think we both like that one a little bit better. Yeah. But man, going against Faye Dunaway, what do you got? See, you'd think this would be a tough choice, but I really fucking love Norma Ray. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about Faye Dunaway, but this is an easy choice for me. <laughs> Sally uh, Field. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely Sally Field. Faye Dunaway and Network is, is good, but I'm with you. I think she should have ta- got it for Chinatown. Um, I don't necessarily, I think that, Peter Finch outshines her. Her character is so fucking despicable. It's really hard to root for her. Whereas Norma Ray is a goddamn hero who is saving this town and getting this town the help it deserves. And how do you not root for her? It's impossible. Her yeah. performance is so good. Sally Field is so damn likable. And yeah, I'm going to go Sally Field every, every single time. I like it. I respect it. I respect it. I, I, I think I would have gone the same just personally. Yeah. It's just, it's such an awesome performance and a movie that has like 
could go terribly. It could go terribly wrong. And she just, she just holds it up. He, she holds it up and I'm really glad I own it. You, you gave it to me as a, just kind of a gift and I'll cherish that DVD forever. Cause it's a really cool movie. Uh, and a great, great Oscar year. The seventies are bonkers when it comes to the, the Oscars and, and movies were just clicking. They just, they had an understanding at that time that I hope we can get back to one day. <laughs> um, let's see here. Okay, this is this is a good one. I think I know where we're gonna go here, but I, but I like the matchup. Uh, we got Catherine Hepburn, the possibly the goat. Four wins. No one else touches her when it comes to all time wins. Twelve nominations altogether. She is absolutely dynamite. I could have chosen on Golden Pond, but I instead went with Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. I, I was I'm hope, I was hoping you would, which uh, of course we you know nice nice late sixties movie. Uh, coming in an era that we love to talk about that late sixties going into the early seventies is lots of fun. And she is still there, still dominating. <laughs> just doing her thing. And guess who's coming together. Guess who's coming to dinner alongside of course, Sydney Poitier, uh, Spencer Tracy. So yeah, just, just an awesome movie. And we did that on the episode with, uh, in the heat of the night. So that was, yeah, that was a cool episode. <laughs> Needless to say, Catherine Hepburn going to be hard to beat. Now, this film, we just did uh, on episode 60. Uh, we, we did Unforgiven, 1992. And that year, Emma Thompson won for her role in Howard's End. So I, I got to throw her in here. You know, we just did that not too long ago. It's fresh in the mind. But I think I know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking hated Howard's End. Um, <laughs> as much as I like Emma Thompson, I, I don't think that performance was particularly Oscar worthy. I would have, if I was going to give it to anybody, I would have given it to Helena Bonham Carter. Uh, whereas, mm. guess who's coming to dinner? Catherine Hepburn. The pain she poured into that performance, knowing that the man she, the man she loved for years, Spencer Tracy, was on his deathbed. And you can see that in her eyes. There's a certain scene in the movie where he's admitting, like, yes, I've been hateful in the past, but I don't want to lose my daughter. And the speech he's giving, you can see her staring at him and sobbing. Because it's not, or that's not performance for her. That's like, he found out he's going to die and she knows it and she's breaking. But it translates into the film so perfectly and her character is so redeemable that it just, it's no wonder she took home four statues over the course of 50 years. Like this is a, the very definition of actress is Catherine Hepburn and you can see it in every single performance she ever gave, but I think guess who's coming to dinner is easily one of her strongest. So Catherine. yeah, 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 that's fair. It, she, she kind of gives the Oscars a bit of like nuance. The, yeah. She's that good. She's that good. She's that dynamite. She's that awesome to watch. And she just pushed the boundaries, you know, off the screen uh, all the time, you know, and, is just a total trailblazer in every sense of the word. And I think was needed for Hollywood. She, she was needed in Hollywood for Hollywood to kind of move forward in some way. I, I know it's a wild industry, but I think people like her have to be there. Otherwise it's going to fucking crash. Uh, she, yeah, she, she's wonderful. Uh, could kind of talk about her, read about her, continue watching her movies forever. That's uh, what I intend on doing. She's amazing. Yeah. And uh, always, always room for more Catherine Hepburn in, in our lives. <laughs> Hell yeah. Now, now, now I, I don't feel as strongly about her sister's work. Audrey. Um, not a, not a, not a huge, huge fan of uh, her stuff, you know, but 1953 is a, a year we, we did re did recently on uh, from here to eternity. So we watched Roman holiday, which Audrey Hepburn got the win for. Uh, I see right now. Uh, I think, what did I just call her? Did I say daughter or sister? I mean, sister. Yeah. I mean, daughter. Yeah. I was going to say, I, yeah, no, they're, they're not related in this list. No, nope. They're not related at all. Uh, Audrey Hepburn, I think took, Hepburn is her stage name in honor of Captain Hepburn. That's what I, I think happened, but they're not actually related. Well, how about that? That blows my mind. <laughs> I thought that for years too. Yeah. Is, is it spelled the same or is there one, is there, is there a letter spelled the same? 
Yep, it's spelled exactly the same. They're just there's no blood there at all. <laughs> that that's crazy because they kind of look a bit alike as well. Interesting. How about that? Well, here she is. She did win in Roman Holiday m- movie that we covered with From Here to Eternity, 1953. Both both uh, Best Picture nominees. Neither of us were that kind of like stoked about watching Roman Holiday. It wasn't like a. I think it's a bit overrated. Uh, but this next one. The, the, the role she's going against has no chance because it's Jessica Tandy and driving Miss Daisy. So <laughs> just, yeah, just had to throw it in there. Cause we've done 1989. We have, we brought up driving Miss Daisy. It's here. So basically this is the consolation prize. Uh, Correct. <laughs> fucking I could defeat Jessica Tandy for best actress. Oh my God. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think you have a good shot. Yeah. <laughs> that movie's a fucking joke. Um, Roman Holiday ain't, it's not great. Audrey Hepburn's pretty good in it. Uh, she and uh, Gregory Peck have pretty good chemistry. Uh, Driving Miss Daisy is a travesty I never hope to see again, but it's a winner, so eventually I'm going to have to. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> so, yeah, easily, Audrey Hepburn. Okay. Yep, there, there she goes. <clears throat> the sister of uh, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, let's see. We got one more match up here in the first round, then we'll move on to the second. Uh, this is this is a good one. Back to 1948. Jane Wyman and Johnny Belinda. Hmm. Awesome stuff. Versus Helen Mirren in The Queen, 2006. Hmm. A movie we talked about uh, when we talked about Little Miss Sunshine. I remember talking about The Queen, and th- these are both pretty strong performances. Uh, I, it's, it's a bit of a toss-up. Well... <laughs> Helen Mirren and the Queen is kind of expected. I mean, if you're going to make a movie about Queen Elizabeth II in 2006, yeah. who else are you going to cast? <laughs> it's Helen Mirren, of course. And she's very good. Um, I think the character of Queen Elizabeth II is a bit dry and hard to really capture as a human being. But then again, it's royalty. So that's kind of not, ex- you know, not a hard topic. Um <laughs> Jane Wyman and Johnny Belinda is lights out. Uh, I think she's the first actress to win an Oscar with for no dialogue. Uh, got to be. Maybe the only. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's got to be, yeah, got to be the only. Um, she's amazing. And Johnny Belinda is a movie that was so ahead of its time and so important. and. It's one I haven't really, it, it pops into my head from time to time. Whereas The Queen, I kind of just watched it and moved on. Uh, Johnny Belinda stayed with me. And I think Jane Wyman's a big part of that. So I'm definitely going to go Jane Wyman. Totally fair. Totally fair. Jane Wyman, another 40s movie, Johnny Belinda, that people should seek out that year. That year is special. That year is really special. Uh, Shores of the Sierra Madre is my favorite, but you can't go wrong with Red Shoes, Snake Pit, or Johnny Belinda. Those are awesome, awesome films. I love that. My favorite thing about that is that prior to doing the Hamlet episode, I hadn't heard of three of those movies. Yeah, yeah. Like, and now I tell everybody about these movies. Yeah, I had I had heard just very very little bit about the Red Shoes. That it was kind of like, oh, if you like Black Swan. You should check out the red shoes, you know, <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know anything about Johnny Belinda snake pit. You know, of course, Church of Sierra Madre is a movie. You just kind of have to see if you like, you know, if you like the history of film, it's one of those like kind of yeah. staples. You should just, you should just check out, but these other ones have, have a lot to say. So I'm really glad Jane Wyman moves on to the second round. <laughs> now, here we go. Now, now it's, now it's getting, getting really tough here. Every single matchup of course, is a winner that you just chose. So let's get down to it. Uh, We haven't talked about Olivia in a second, so let's go back to her. She is facing Sally Field. Ah. Before I go into that, I do want to point out something I noticed about uh, the way I was able to get a hold of the heiress. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My local half-price books uh, is in a college town, San Marcos, Texas, and I realized So many students are taking film classes and so many students don't 
want these movies when the class is over. So they take all these classics they get a hold of and throw them into half price books. And who gets a hold of these classics? But me, constantly. So I find more classics at this half price than I do at any other store I go to. And that's why. And I fucking love that. That's fantastic. I love that. So the heiress is just sitting on the on the shelf and you're like, fucking yeah. yeah seven bucks. <laughs> I'm like, sure, why not? I didn't know it yeah. was rare. I just was like, oh, I'll take that. So super rare. Yeah. yeah. Super, super tough to find. You know, uh, you have to usually order online. So yeah, it's, it's a tough DVD to find. Uh, great stuff though. You, you just, you just bought a movie that led the 2020, sorry, 22nd Academy Awards in nominations and wins. So why not? You know, it's a, it's kind of a piece of Oscar history. Beautiful. So Olivia versus Sally. Um, yep. <laughs> 1979 versus the heiress 1949 so yeah we got 30 years there <laughs> Olivia de Havilland's performance in the heiress like I said is very transformative it's kind of riches to more riches uh just kind of skipping the whole rags part but really more <laughs> like hope into miser you know and you get it it's a performance that is aided by everybody else that is kind of just it's the opposite of what I expected from this. Usually these, you know, films around this time are, you know, we got, you know, love wins out. Love wins over all, you know, nobody can stop the love train, but this is more like, fuck that. Everyone's out to get me. And I realized that. So it's, it's a, it's very uh, polar opposite to what you expect from films of this time. Whereas 1979, you've got, you know, a lot of revolutions going down and it makes sense for that time. Norma Ray is a film that makes sense for 1979. Mm. And I do think Sally Field's performance in that is supremely special. And I'm going to, I'm going to pick Sally Field. I like it. I, f- I figured, I figured we were pretty rocked by that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would have a very hard time. I, I might, I don't know. That's a total toss up to me. It's 50, 50. You can't go wrong with either of those. Um, Personally, I think Olivia was so much more exciting in the snake pit. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, that's a great, great performance. Uh, but loses to Jane Wyman. So it's kind of hard, you know, hey, yeah. that's tough, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the competition we love. Uh, love at the Oscars. Occasionally you get two Titans going at it, you know, two great performances. Uh, let's go back to Jane Wyman. She is taking on. 1996, Francis McDormand. <laughs> Two strong female heroes. Jane Wyman versus Francis McDormand. Mm, that is that's a rough decision to make. Uh, well, I've sung these films' praises. Uh, it's really, it comes down to personal preference. And it's it's just... Because I've loved it for so long, it's got to go. I got to go Fargo. Francis McDormand. Francis. Sorry, Jane, yep. but I love Johnny Belinda, but I did only see it once where I've seen Fargo many times. And that film has just a special place. It, it, it gets better with each viewing. That's yeah. that's the thing that Fargo has going for it. I remember talking about how we both, because we were picking awards for it, and you had to like find those things and really hone in and you realize how difficult it is. That's when you're like, wait a minute, I need to kind of reassess how I feel about this movie. And it's like, Oh, I, I moved, I remember saying I moved it up from an eight to a nine, you know, it just moved up a whole rating because I was like, ah, man, this, <laughs> this movie's, this movie's better. And I think I stack it up against Cohen films rather than just other films. You kind of have to, I mean, they're their own. It's so genre. hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard. You know, I want to I want it to live up to how I feel about my favorite Cohen movies, but it just kind of has slowly found a little spot that, I, that I, it's I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for it. And Francis is at the center of it, just tearing it up. And how about her uh, chemistry and the relationship between, you know, John Carroll Lynch and Francis McDormand? It's just so great. It's so, so just so goddamn wholesome. <laughs> That's a perfect, you know, cinematic relationship. Just, you know, a a relationship that works, you know, both are putting so much into it and you believe it 
and you know they surprise each other at work and they do stuff for one another it's just it's it's sweet but at the same time she's a hardcore cop who takes down a psychopath shoving a dude into a wood chipper <laughs> like and then just goes home while pregnant by the way and, yeah and then just goes home and is like how was your day <laughs> you betcha yeah so good so yeah she rightfully has a place in the final four uh along with Along with Sally Field. Uh, here we are. Ingrid Bergman first Catherine Hepburn. Guess who's coming to dinner? First Gaslight. Oh, boy. Jesus, that matchup is... <laughs> Bergman versus Hepburn. Oh, my God. I mean, that... that yeah, it, I, I, I want to stress how, how amazing those two people are. <laughs> and how, it, it, it really is, you know, it's hard to kind of put into context for now, you know, uh, someone who's just watched more modern films. There, there really aren't two women in the, in the industry right now that are as, you know, transcendent as these two. Like we don't have, we don't have that right now. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't just come around. I think, I think Kate Blanchett is, 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 the, is like there is right, right there. You know, and of course, Frances McDormand, she's a little bit past her, you know, younger years, but she's still here, still doing really cool stuff. So you can talk about her. But Ingrid and Catherine are just, again, Catherine's a trailblazer. So is Ingrid. They're both so huge for the industry. And it, I hope I hope people check out their work, you know, because I know you and I have just kind of, we knew about them. And then with, with the show here, we've kind of taken a deeper dive into, oh, man, this is why. They're so renowned. This is why they were icons. Yeah. Well, let, you know, you said that we don't really have actors comparable to people like this who became legends like in their own time. And I think, you know, that goes back to the conversation we had a few weeks ago about staying power. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was last week. Um, and just how films today are made for like a week at a time. When Yeah. And these films from 50 years ago still hold up. There's just something about the care and attention that everybody involved puts into these films that make them last this long. And these actresses were a significant part of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just interesting to, talk, to think about. It is. Uh, it is. It, yeah. This, this is the, this is the shit that we like to just think about in our spare time, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Ingrid Bergman. What does she mean to, you know, just the movie movie world, the movie community. And yeah. the, she means a lot. She means a lot. She may not culturally get brought up all the time now, but man, the people who know, <laughs> they fucking know. Gaslight versus guess who's coming to dinner. 1944 versus 1967. Mm. Uh, I gotta go yeah. Hepburn. I gotta go Hepburn. Oof. Man, <laughs> that's a tough decision to make, but that film really got into my head and really just, I loved it so much. And Gaslight is a good movie. It's just, it's not Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. There's a, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it's just. Interesting. <laughs> I think I like Gaslight as a film a bit more. And that's why I would maybe be biased and give the edge to Ingrid, but. Guess who's coming? Yeah, it is great. And it's also got Spencer and Sydney just pretty lights out in it as well. So yeah, that, that's got a lot of stuff going for it. Yeah. And it's uh, yeah. And it's such an interesting time in the movie industry. A, a rapid change was coming. Uh, and it's kind of like in the middle of it, right at the beginning of it. Yeah. Um, let's go to uh, Catherine's sister, daughter. <laughs> uh Obviously, I need to watch a documentary or something about uh, about Catherine Hepburn so I can, you know, learn why I thought that. <laughs> my uh, my grandma has uh, Catherine Hepburn's autobiography. I'm, oh I'm, man, I might I might give that a read. Yeah, that'd be that'd be fascinating. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. I guess I just thought that. I guess I just assumed most people they're, do. Yeah, they're they're born in uh, Catherine's born in. 1907 1908 somewhere in there and then audrey's born in the late 20s so i just thought uh it seems like a a gap that would would make sense <laughs> it might have so been stupid. like a like a studio decision you know like hey she kind of looks like Catherine hepburn why don't we 
you know, call her Hepburn and try to make her the next one. It could have that's very what much I, been that. That's exactly what I need to seek out and learn yeah. is like, there's got to be a reason for that happening. You That doesn't happen by accident because her, uh, Audrey's uh, birth name, like last name is like Rooston or something like that. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the, uh, this is a, this is a weird matchup. You got Audrey, 1953, Roman Holiday. For Spree Larson, 2015, room. <clears throat> ah, both women trapped in the world that is beyond their control. Hmm. Mm, um, trapped. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I mean, I'd rather be, you know, princess of a fake country than trapped in a box for 10 years. But, you know, still. Uh, Hepburn versus Larson. In terms of strength of the performance, I'm going to have to go Brie Larson. I really think she poured a lot into that performance. Totally fair. Totally fair. That's what I. That's what I would have voted as well. Uh, yeah, a, a bit, a bit forgotten already. Just six years later, I think people should revisit that movie. Give it a, give it another go. She just got to the final four. Uh, she's with Catherine Hepburn, Frances McDormand, and Sally Field here in the final four of this little Oscar Sunday Best Actress bracket. Uh, let's get let's get down to it. Sally Field versus Francis McDormand. Shit. 1979 <laughs> versus 1976. Norma Ray versus Marge. <laughs> Margie. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, that's tough. I already know who the last two are going to be. I know who this is going to end up. I'm going to have to decide between. And it's kind of, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be Francis McDormand. <laughs> Francis. Sally Field, you made it far, you know, and uh, you, of course, <clears throat> have, you know, the Lincoln nomination and the, the other win for Places in the Heart. Two wins, three nominations for acting. She's got she's got a really cool career. and I'm really glad we got to see that movie and get a different perspective on her. But Frances, yeah, she's uh, just been huge in our lives for a long time because of the Collins. And then everything outside of that seems to also be dynamite that she does. So. Yeah. Like fucking nomad land. Uh, yeah. Yeah. She's, she's amazing. Uh, now Catherine Hepburn versus Brie Larson. We got new school versus old school. Big time here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I, we know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it's Catherine Hepburn, but yeah, it's uh, particularly the performance in guess who's coming to dinner that really resonated with me. Um, yeah. This is going to be, hard to pick a winner here <laughs> yeah yeah you guessed it francis mcdormand versus Catherine hepburn yeah 96 <laughs> for 67 oh boy you goat got versus goat Ugh. yeah yeah you got you got four wins versus three wins here <laughs> <laughs> oh boy fargo versus guess who's coming to dinner both nines in my eyes both oscars well deserved for their lead actress uh two people who are fairly similar in what they fought for in Hollywood. Uh, mm. I think that, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but I would bet Catherine Hepburn was maybe an idol of Francis McDormand. Mm, I, probably. Uh, damn. <laughs> and now she's going against her here in our, our championship round. <laughs> oh, Marge Gunderson versus, I don't remember her name and guess she's coming to dinner. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up right now. Yeah, see what we can see. What we can do. Guess who's coming to dinner? Uh, yeah, this is tough. This is a tough one. Okay. Two two titans. <laughs> um. Hmm. Okay. Where are you where, where are you at right now? What are you thinking? I'm thinking about like their significance to the story and like what they brought. You know, everything they poured into their performances. You've got, oh, you know, Marge Gunderson doesn't pop up till like 40 minutes into the movie. Yeah, and Joey, Joey Drayton. There we go. Mm. Married to Matt Drayton. 1967, an older white couple finds out their daughter's going to marry a black man, and they have to deal with that. The way they deal with that, she is very much at the beginning like, I don't know about that, but then she realizes, you know, he's a good man, and... My daughter deserves to be loved. And all that matters is that she marry a good man. 
And she tries to bring that. I'm trying to talk my way through the plot. Like, where was the moment where I was like, this is amazing. I, oh, this is, ah, this is, this is Sophie's choice. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> Fuck Meryl Streep. This is Sophie's choice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got to go with my heart. I got to go with my gut. I got to go with incredible strength and what the performance means to the film. I got to go Catherine Hepburn. Fantastic. <laughs> Catherine Hepburn. And, and uh, her, her name is Christina Drayton. The daughter is Joy Drayton. Okay. So Christina Drayton just beat Marge in the final round here. How, how do you feel? How do you feel about that? The, the, oh. the, the four-time, four-time Oscar winner winning the tournament (laughs) it makes sense but i am i i shit i feel like if we'd added you know if we'd done more best actress winners before this episode this could look completely different oh Uh, yeah when i left out you know like one of my personal favorites is louise fletcher one for the cuckoo's nest i left that out completely i try to do films that we've covered here but oh yeah there's there's plenty more that we both love yeah oh boy and uh like i love Catherine hepburn in I guess she's coming to on, dinner, but on Golden Pond. Yeah, on Golden Pond. And also, she's not even close to my favorite best actress win, uh, which we haven't covered yet on this show. So, you know, when we get there, you know, well, she'll win that. Well, let's see if I can guess what it is. Uh, is it Jodie Foster? I am pretty predictable, aren't I? Jody Foster, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought, I thought, I thought maybe it was that or Kathy Bates in Misery. It's depending on you know how I'm feeling on any given day. It's kind of a toss up between them two. Yeah, and then some recent films we did not cover uh, that because we haven't really brought them up too much is uh, Jennifer Lawrence, Silver Lang's Playbook, Emma Stone in La La Land, Frances McDormand, Three Billboards, uh, Emma Stone again in The Favorite. Uh, Renee Zellweger and Judy, and then of course Francis McDormand again in Nomadland. Um, Reese Olivia, Witherspoon walk. Reese Olivia Witherspoon Coleman walk. in the favorite. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say Emma Stone doesn't have that one. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know why it took so long. Rachel Weisz to me should have won that one. I thought she was the best performer in that movie. Uh, love the favorite though. So yeah, Olivia winning is is no big deal. That's right. That's the year Olivia and Regina King won, 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, man. Uh, these, these are fun. You got, oh, we got Diane Keaton and Annie Hall. She's pretty good in that. Uh, Cher and Moonstruck. That's one we could have talked about because we both seen that. Yeah, some good stuff. Yeah, I agree. I like that. I'm glad I created these uh, letterbox lists because I like adding to those. I have one for lead actor, lead actor, supporting actor, supporting actress, and director. And it always feels good to add one to that list. I feel like I'm, you know, putting a piece into a jigsaw puzzle that's going to look amazing when i finally finish it yeah exactly that's better box is great to for personal reasons and then to be able to reference stuff very easily like this <laughs> i was able to not tell you about this idea because i could look at your fucking <laughs> letterbox that's i love that social media for movie people uh now that was that was fun as hell i love doing shit like that um but the you know the name of the game is uh is is uh the heiress today and we we gotta gotta talk about that movie you know a little bit more <laughs> which i'm excited about I, I but i love i love shouting out performers man we love we love actors we love people who shine in movies uh you and i are both just kind of easily swept away when someone just kind of shows up knocks it out we're both like yep we give them their flowers you know we love doing that here on oscar sunday so we're gonna do that with some people that are involved, you know, worked on uh, the heiress because we have, we have some heavy hitters, including of course, Olivia. So I, I want to start with the man in the chair, uh, William Wyler. Uh, uh, this is, uh, this is one where you're going to have to yeah, get a fucking snack, you know, get a, get a, get a, get a, get a fucking beer if you need to, you know, <laughs> William, William Wyler is, uh, is an absolute Titan when it comes to the Oscars, a guy who just is making movies left and right during this time. And uh, I know, I know last week we, I called him Billy Wilder. And then instead of William Wyler, like I'm like, I'm his fucking friend. <laughs> and then, and then we had a mix up, you know, we had a, we had, a, we had <laughs> these, these fucking old directors, you know, <laughs> whether it's the Wilder Wilder or fucking Fred Zinneman, 
<laughs> you know, these guys are never going to stop fucking with us. Yeah. So I am well aware Billy Wilder did not direct the heiress. Yeah. I, I know that wholeheartedly. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> I, I know this. And now I know that the Hepburns aren't even fucking related. <laughs> yeah, see, we both fucked up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fuck up all the time. Uh, it's just like my, my middle name. <laughs> Uh, but 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 this guy, this guy William Wyler, yeah yeah, buckle up. He has he has a nice resume here when it comes to the Oscars. He's nominated 1936 Best Director for Dodsworth. Have not seen that one. Uh, 1939 is nominated again for Best Director Wuthering Heights. I've heard good things about that one. Have not been able to check it out. How about you? I've Wuthering Heights. I I don't tend to watch a lot of films based on like super classic literature. Cause I'm not that big a fan of classic literature. So totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's totally fair. I understand that. Uh, the letter 1940, he was nominated again for best director. That's a starring Betty Davis. Another legend that I know will get brought up on this show one day properly. Uh, nominated again for best director, the little foxes 1941. So you can just see a pattern here. It's so almost every year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1943, he gets his first win. Uh, Mrs. Miniver, uh, 1943. So he was not there at that show. He was overseas, fucking, you know, being a fucking, you know, being a worker, you know, being being a person who wasn't like, oh, I'm just going to show up at this show. But uh, yeah, he was shooting just, in the Air Force. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, right here on IMDb. You know, uh, I I believe his wife is the one who, yeah, yeah, his wife is the one who who accepted the award on his behalf. So. Yeah. Ah, fantastic in his first win he wasn't even there and then he wins again just a few years later 1946 the best years of our lives i mm. have not seen that, that one but been meaning to check it out yes definitely that's been uh, that's been on the brain for a long time that's uh that's a big one uh nominated for best director 1949 the heiress which is of course what we're talking about today uh nominated again best director detective story 1951 He's just fucking stacking them up. Uh, here he is again, uh, Roman Holiday, nominated for Best Director and Best Picture as a producer. Uh, of course, that's a film that, again, we are both a bit underwhelmed by, but it is solid. It's worth watching. Uh, nominated again for Best Director and Best Picture as a producer for Friendly Persuasion, 1956. Oscar winner for 1959's Ben-Hur as the Best Director. A huge, huge movie that you just kind of kind of can't miss <laughs> you know, it's it's one that won loads and loads of oscars and kind of dominated that show so and he's you know at the forefront of it uh, and then his last nomination is uh the collector best director 1965 he won in a won a uh, honorary award in 1966 a year later so yeah uh this is one of the more impressive resumes we've ever looked at on this show it just it's full of stuff that's very recognizable movies that clearly mean a lot and have, you know, lasted for a reason. And, you know, we, we found one today in the airs. Absolutely. William Wyler is a name that you, I mean, if you're experimenting in classic film, he's one of the guys who first pops up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ben Hur is one I've got to get to. It's, you know, one considered one of the greatest films of the 20th century. It's like a four hour long Christ epic. So not exactly run into it, but I will watch it. Um, the Collector is a film that's been on my radar for a, about a year now because of how darkly influential this film has been to a lot of murder. Uh, the Collector, I think I talked about this on Filmgasm once. This film and the book it was based on has inspired at least four separate serial killers. Yeah, uh, Christ. So I, I got to see this thing. Uh, yeah, so that's just a movie that's, you know, has a lot of darkness around it. Hell yeah. Yeah. Just something that's kind of waiting for us. You know, yeah. it's definitely right up our alley. Uh, he, he's the man. He's the man. He's going to get brought up over and over. There's people that we've, I've said that many times that might be redundant at this point, but he really is at the, one of the guys at the top of that list that will, will show up when you're talking about classic Hollywood in this era. He, he's there. He's there. He's very present. Uh, Olivia. Olivia de Havilland, this run she has in the 40s is fucking nuts. You know, it's, it's not every day you see 
someone get five nominations and two wins inside of, you know, fucking 10 years, you know, that's, that's crazy. So she gets a nomination for Gone with the Wind, 1939, best actress in a supporting role. She gets a nomination for Hold, Hold Back the Dawn, 1941, best actress in a lead role. And then she wins uh, best actress in a lead role for To Each His Own, 1946. Nominated again in 1948 for The Snake Pit, best actress in a lead role. And then she wins on her last nomination for this movie that we're talking about today. 1949's The Heiress. So from 1939 to 1949, she gets five nominations <laughs> for performing and, and two wins. Not easy. <laughs> Not easy to do. She's, she's one of the best of, of this decade and, and the whole era. Yeah. And it's not like after 1949, she just like retired. And that's why. She no, she kept going, going for like years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Her last uh, acting credits in 1988. Uh, she was in The Swarm, 1978. Fuck uh, yeah. Super like weird ho- horror movie about like killer bees. I, I got to see that just because this two time acting legend is in this movie. Y- exactly. Yeah. It gives you gives you context. Yeah. For a year, like, for, I know that for years, she and her sister, Joan Fontaine, had a pretty bitter rivalry uh, in, in, the, in Hollywood. They were co- often competing for roles. And uh, I think up to her, up to Joan Fontaine's deathbed, they were not cool with each other. Like, there was, there was a beef there. So uh, sad. Very sad. And Joan Fontaine, equally fantastic actress. Uh, yeah, so I, know, I knew Olivia mostly from The Feud. So it's nice to get to actually see her work. Uh, the, uh, she was in the Adventures of Robin Hood. She put, she was made Marion the yeah. Elfman. To me, the yeah. only decent Robin Hood movie they've ever made. Oh yeah, it's the best one by a mile. Yeah. Ah yeah, she's she was great. Yeah yeah, I I, I, I love her work. I can't wait to see the other stuff. You know. I can't wait to see teach his own, see the other win that she has. It's going to be, going to be a fun, you know, uh, journey with Olivia. And there's, there's a reason we kind of chose her, you know, uh, to kind of base the episode around this performance, this movie, this, you know, era of, of movies. She's, she's someone that we want to talk about. Uh, <laughs> and, and here, here we are with uh, another guy that we talked about recently uh, on our best picture showdown from here to eternity. It's Montgomery Clift. Yeah. A four, a four time nominee, no wins. So sad. <laughs> you, hate, you hate to see that when they rack him up and don't get the win. Uh, he's nominated for The Search, 1948, uh, A Place in the Sun, 1951, From Here to Eternity, 1953, and fucking Judgment at Nuremberg, 1961. So, yeah, I mean, the guy's awesome. The guy kicks ass. He's so good in this movie. He, his character, despicable, but. He is so good in the heiress as Morris. I was, I was blown away by the, because you have, you really have no idea. It's really an actual twist. And you really have no idea that this guy is, is he, is he really just a fucking sleaze? And the fact that he is, when you look back, it's just, it's an awesome performance. It really is. It's even more admirable. You, uh, you learn that he and uh, Olivia did not get along. Uh, Mm. He didn't think she was that good. Like, in 1949, he, who was really kind of just starting out as like, was really just starting out. This was his third movie. Yeah. Thought Academy Award winner Olivia de Havilland wasn't quite that good. That that's that's a little weird. Uh, who walked away with the Oscar, Monty? Anyway, yeah, yeah, buddy. <laughs> he didn't really have. I mean, 18 credits. Montgomery Cliff did not have that uh, big of a career. He died fairly young. Uh, yeah coronary occlusion at 45 years old jesus yeah it sucks i mean yeah that's same age as some of the guys we've lost you know like chadwick was in his in his 40s philip Seymour hoffman was in his 40s it sucks to see someone kind of go when it's clearly a turning point in their career yeah and you can see oh they're about to become uh you know like an old man you know and <laughs> once they get into their 50s they're going to start playing different roles and it hates to it, you hate to see that get cut off God, we got to we gotta, eventually when we get to the 60s, we've got to carve out some time for Judgment at Nuremberg. This is a film that keeps coming up again and again and again. 
when we go it, back. It, it's so hard. It's so hard because 1961 has the hustler, which I just want to do so bad on this I show, know. you know, I know, <laughs> but I, but I, I love both of them. I love both of them. You know, they're polar opposites, but I, I love them both. And it makes you just kind of want to do a best picture showdown so we can do them both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, 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 it's super tough. Montgomery Clift is the man. He's someone I'm just very glad that I've been exposed to his work through this show. Uh, he's he's awesome. He's so good. And from here to eternity, fuck. Uh, everybody's great in that movie, though. So uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, Ralph Richardson. Uh, here's here's an interesting performer. He was nominated for best supporting actor right here in the Eras. And then he was nominated again for a supporting role in Grey Stoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, 1984. And that was a posthumous uh, nomination. So those are his only two. They're fucking 35 years apart. And this dude has a whole lot in between. You know, I, I, I kind of learned, oh, here's an IMDb uh, page that's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love when you look at some of these, some of these old actors that spanned over, you know, from the 40s to the 80s you're like holy shit all the different kinds of films they've worked on ralph richardson's one of those guys yeah i'm just now realizing that he played god in time bandits <laughs> hell yeah i that's yeah, awesome same i just saw that too I was like, wait what <laughs> oh, that's Put that shit together yeah it's fantastic it's these guys you know you you wonder where they came from and ralph richardson's a guy who apparently has been in my peripheral since I was a kid and I never knew his name. And uh, now I know that's great. That's great. Knowing is half is half the battle as GI Joe taught me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I think, yeah, no, knowledge is power. You know, uh, when you're talking about, when you're talking about movies, you, you having that random shit in the back of your head. Yeah. It will come up one day. You know, what goes around comes around. And when you're talking about movies, oh, shit. <laughs> I love those oh, shit moments. They're the best. Uh, I After this person, and I got one more performer. And then, and then the next guy sort of blew me away like that. Uh, we got uh, Miriam Hopkins. Now, she was not nominated in The Heiress, but she was nominated for her role uh, in Becky Sharp, 1935. And that that's it. You know, Golden Globe nomination for the heiress. You know, there's a few other random things, but this is this is really it as far as the awards, you know, awards go. No other movie, no other role. Just Becky Sharp nominated. Makes me curious, you know, because what is that? You know, is this is there a story to that? There's always something interesting about these 30s and 40s performers because it feels like they at least get two or three, you know, because there's not there's not a tremendous amount of competition like there is today. So you would think that they'd come up again. You know what I mean? You'd think, yeah. I I don't know. But also back then, you know, there were new actors every day. There were new people who studios were trying to bill as like, you know, the next John Star. Wayne. Yeah. Next stars. Yeah, stars. So even if you were good, you had to be great. Like you had to be great and you had to be a box office success or Hollywood was done with you super fast and you know you got downgraded to supporting roles you became you know the aunt you became the uncle you became you know the friend you weren't the love interest anymore you weren't the hero and you just kind of had to deal with that if you wanted a career hollywood like we think hollywood's unforgiving now <laughs> back then like cutthroat is too nice a word yeah i agree hey very way too nice yeah way too generous to say cutthroat <laughs> <laughs> and this becky sharp it's a uh it's an adaptation of the novel vanity fair by william makepeace thackeray uh, i think he's the same guy who wrote barry linden oh uh, that's so a good connection that, that might be right yeah it's very much a uh you know period film of 1700s drama it's an hour 24 so it might be worth checking out the only oh, nomination yeah. it got was her <laughs> yeah very curious yeah you, yeah you had my curiosity <laughs> uh yeah miriam hopkins she's really good in this movie as L lavinia uh Pinnaman. she's an essential character very essential to just kind of the way people are swayed 
yeah. uh, especially especially Olivia Olivia de Havilland's character. Uh, yeah, super super good stuff from her. Now um, now we got some some technical people here, some people who worked uh, behind behind the camera that I want to talk about. Uh, and the first one would be the composer Aaron Copland. Aaron Copland, uh, I, I didn't I didn't quite know uh, this guy. He, he went he won an Oscar for the Eris 1949 best best score was also nominated uh, in 1939 of Mice and Men uh, for best original score and best scoring. Uh, I don't fucking know. You know, the Oscars are weird. Uh, <laughs> and then you have uh, the exact same thing happened. Best music, original score, best music score <laughs> for our town, 1940. And you have the North star, uh, 1943. So nice little resume, but what I was kind of, confused by and what i thought was really cool what i kind of read about was that he's featured in some movies like he got game he's in the soundtrack of the spike lee film that i love and then i read that he's a he's a new yorker through and through this aaron copland guy and that spike lee kind of you know kind of kind of looked up to him thought he was really cool thought he thought his scores stood out even in an era where they were kind of all the same you know (laughs) and i was like he's right the score for the heiress is fucking dynamite. It's so cool. It's so badass. It's, I'm really glad it's one of the wins that it got. I was, I was, I, that was a big part of it for me. It, the way it just kind of shifted. And then when you see a couple of the turns and it just gets fucking intense. And a lot of the forties movies won't sell that. They won't really commit to that. Yeah. And Aaron, Aaron Copland and, in, in the heiress is really committed to making it feel fucking creepy feel really eerie and really dark at times. I, I was, I was really happy with it. Oh, he definitely delivers something that stands out. We've often, you know, when we go this far back, it's really hard to pick an award for music because there's, there's no variety. All these scores sound like they were made in a factory and shipped out for movies. Like there's no originality to these, to this music a lot of times. So when you get a score like this, it's special and you really dig into it. And it really reinforces the moments of the film that are just unforgiving. And I appreciated that. It, it's a film, it helps the film stand out amongst, you know, kind of a sea of like samesies. So cool. So cool, man. I love it. Love, love this shit. I love, these are the people I just won't forget about. You know, when I, when I learn about them, I see, see some of the stuff for myself and in this case, hear it. Yeah. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. Love, love that I uh, know who Aaron Copland is now, and I, I want to learn more because he seems to be just kind of all over the place in weird spots within the movie movie world. So I'm all in on Aaron Copland. Uh, Leo Tover is the next guy I want to talk about, cinematographer. The heiress, good Lord. <laughs> uh, some, some breathtaking stuff. You know, I think it's a lot to do with the production design and what's going on around it, but... Some of the, you know, you know, this it's a it's a black and white film, and it it kind of needs to be. It's so gorgeous, so breathtaking. I thought it I thought it worked in its favor. Sometimes, you know, I think the black and white really does make a movie have a have a tone that that just kind of heightens it, you know. And with the heiress, I thought it, I, th- I thought it like worked in this case. Oh, definitely. There's a like there's a couple scenes that particularly stand out like after Morris has a- abandoned uh, Catherine and she's walking up the stairs with her luggage. And there's this look of pure despair on her face, the shadows, the way the shadows complement that the, the angle of the stairs, it's very ahead of its time. Yes. And yeah. You can definitely see an eye here. Yeah. Yeah. Which which sucks because I, you know, I was excited. I was like, man, whoever the fuck is in charge of the camera here is is a goddamn genius. You know, I really that was one of the things I took away from watching the heiress is fuck, there's an attention to detail that I love, like you just pointed out. Only two nominations for Mr. Leo Tover. Uh, best cinematography for both black and white, hold back the dawn, 1941, and the heiress, 1949. That's it. Hmm. Uh, that that shit doesn't make sense to me. This guy. I got to see more stuff to see if they're wrong. <laughs> well, I can see in his uh, biography here, or his filmography, we have seen one of his movies, and it is probably the movie that killed him. The Conqueror. What do you see? 1956. Oh, yeah. The movie 
movie killed everybody. Yeah. Well, yeah, he died in 1964. Yeah. Age 62. So that's definitely possible. Yeah. Fuck. Every time I see that movie on somebody's resume, I'm like, well, fuck that killed them then. Like, <sighs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There it is. Director yeah. of photography. Uh, but that, that wild fucking movie. <laughs> yeah. That piece of shit. But he's also the guy behind the day the earth stood still, which is a absolute sci-fi classic. Uh, yes. Really cool. Neat resume. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kind of scrolling through it right now. And I'm like, this is awesome. Really, really digging what this guy's got going on. It's stuff I, you know, heard about or want to see or random things I have seen. Director of photography for the snake pit. That makes ah, sense. Just, just saw that. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. I love it. Yeah. Leo Tover. Uh, yeah. Definitely has a really cool, distinct style that I would like to like to research more. Um. I just mentioned the production design. Got to bring it up. Uh, we have we have two people who are kind of involved in that. First one I'll bring up is John Meehan. Uh, this dude. This dude has a really, really interesting resume. Uh, he probably worked in The Conqueror as well because he passed away in 1963. It feels like. Let's see if he did. Mm, it's 1956, right? Yeah. No, I don't think he did, actually. No, but, you know, it, like, People who worked on the Conqueror weren't the only people getting cancer in LA. <laughs> yeah, I just it, the the time frame made so much sense. It was the exact same as as uh, as Leo Tover. <laughs> yeah, that would that would have been weird. That's really really weird. Yeah, yeah. really fascinating. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, this guy this guy kind of uh, got my attention because he has three Oscar wins on three nominations. Nice. Uh, the the heiress, nineteen forty nine, Sunset Boulevard, nineteen fifty. Jesus Christ. And 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, 1954. What a run. Ah. Wow. Sunset Boulevard, that movie is 80% production design. Yeah, truly. <laughs> wow. Truly. It's a, it's a movie that will uh, inevitably get brought up on the show one day. It's, a, it's one of those that also has lasted, you know, has, has for some people aged like fine wine. Like it's just still here, still looks good. Oh, yeah. Everything, everything about it is fine. Uh, and y- y- you have to... You have to point at these people, the people that are in charge of how it looks, how it comes off, how authentic and professional it looks. These people are important. Uh, John Meehan was working essentially with a, a, a teammate here uh, on the heiress. Uh, he was the, technically he was in charge of art direction and this guy was in charge of uh, production design. That'd be Harry Horner. Mm. Harry Horner. Right off the bat, if you look at his IMDb, you see The Hustler, 1961. <laughs> And then you see the heiress, 1949, and you're like, okay, this is, yeah, this guy's going to be a winner. You know, he's, he, he's fantastic. Won two Oscars on three nominations. Uh, you got Best Art Direction, The Heiress, 1949. The Hustler, 1961, got the win. And then he was nominated again in 1969 for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? What a cool run. <laughs> the, these, these folks right here uh, is one of my favorite parts of my whole week is getting to talk about these folks that just don't, they're not, they're not stars, but you can't have a star if you don't have people that know what they're doing in these positions. And this movie has people at the peak of their game, you know, just all shining really bright. So it makes sense that it, it you know, had eight nominations, uh, four wins. It makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. The building blocks of a film. These are the guys who yeah. put together, you know, the set that allows these actors to be who they are. And there's one film in Harry Horner's uh, filmography here. Who is Harry Kellerman and why is he saying those terrible things about me? Based on the title alone, I got it. I got to see this. Yeah. Sounds like a film guys movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's oh perfect. I, I love that. Uh, <laughs> I love crazy titles like that. If I ever was to make a movie, I, I would probably want to do something silly like that. Just to, just to catch people's eye like us, you know, we're like, Oh, I got to see it. I don't even give a shit what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow harry horner's the production designer on separate tables there you go 1958 yeah. that's been on our radar for a while now yeah that's one we're probably should just go ahead and carve out time for it you know just it's burt it's burt it's birdie it's burt, burt. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i love it we got, got two more people here before we can kind of we'll, we'll kind of we'll kind of skim through the 22nd academy awards here in a little bit and then we'll finally get to our awards. But I got, I got two more people. Very, very important. Uh, William Hornbeck. So this is a film editor. And I, 
I want to say he's been brought up at some point on the show. Not sure when exactly. Could probably find it on his, on his IMDb if you want to actually scroll through all that. But he, he he's he's got he's got a lot a lot of shit to say. When you look at his big his his big credits, you know, uh, it's a wonderful life is the first one you see, you know, and that immediately, okay, wait a minute, you you know, you go to his go to his nominations. Sure enough, he's nominated for It's a Wonderful Life, Best Film Editing, nineteen forty six. He wins Best Film Editing, nineteen fifty one, A Place in the Sun. Uh, he's nominated again for Giant in 1956 and then nominated for the last time in 1958 for I Want to Live. Uh, and then, yeah, you look, I don't know if you're scrolling right now. He was the editor of Shane yeah. uh, from 1953, which we both watched. And you just keep going through. And these are just movies that you have definitely heard of. You know, they're I've, I've seen them around before. And I, I'm not sure when I when he was brought up, maybe he wasn't, but he just seems like one of those guys who's kind of uh, intertwined with all these different all these different people and a place in the sun's already been brought up right here on this conversation so it's just cool how they are all kind of connected yeah that's the thing about no classic hollywood is these guys really just like went from lot to lot doing you know work on multiple films and that's why their resumes are you know hundreds of credits i mean he's got 290 credits a lot of them short films uh in the 20s yeah, I see that. And you just, you know, you keep them coming. It's uh, it's how movies used to work. <laughs> wow, I just I just read this here. Uh, American Motion Picture editor, who in 1977 was voted by a hundred of his peers as the best his profession had to offer. Whoa, Ooh. Jesus! Wow. Yeah, uh, a renowned a renowned man uh, and film editors. A lot of times get just fucked. They get fucked in the ass by the studios and I've read multiple stories. Uh, one of my favorite stories is about uh, whiplash David Giselle and his team, how quickly they had to had how quickly they had to do things and edit it and actually to, to get this movie out in the theaters and for people to trust him, he was so young, you know, and, and hadn't done anything yet except for a short, it, 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 they're just, they're hounding you. You have to get this shit on my desk in however many hours. And that happens a lot to editors where they literally have to lock themselves in a room. These are my favorite people to think about. They lock themselves in a room and everything has to go away, you know, and, and this is my job. This is what I'm doing. I have to fucking cut the film now and things are going to be taken away. Things are going to be edited. And that, what a crazy job to have that on your shoulders, you know, especially if you're doing it for a different director. You know, yeah. there's, there's people, there's a lot of people now who have taken that on themselves. You know, there's, there's directors, you know, writers that like Chloe Zhao. It's like, I'm going to do that myself. It's going to be my product. You know, it's going to be my movie. Uh, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it has to be like a, a, a team effort. Well, also it's kind of frowned upon for directors to edit their own work. There's like a, a some kind of bylaw in the director's guild or something. That's why the Coen brothers, had to do it under an alias for so long. Roderick James was there, was them. It's their editor on most of their films, if not all of them, is Roderick James, who was just the Coen brothers. Yeah. Which yeah. is kind of neat. Uh, I do want to point out, William Hornbeck worked with Max Sennett in 1916, and Max Sennett is the first producer who hired Charlie Chaplin. Oh, there you go. There partnership led to all of Chaplin's short films. He kind of taught Chaplin everything he knew about filmmaking. That's so, fucking awesome. These guys are all connected. <laughs> yeah, so cool. Yeah, we just got to talk about Chaplin last week. So yeah, yeah. Love it. This is the coolest part of this era. Uh, last, last guy I want to talk about is, you know, the most decorated guy we've talked about aside from William Wyler. And that's Gordon Jennings, uh, head of special effects. For, for the heiress and I looked at his resume and I was like good fucking jeepers creepers <laughs> this is crazy uh, two, two Oscar wins but uh, let, let's start from, from the bottom because at the very bottom is an honorary award 1939 <laughs> for outstanding achievements in creating special photographic and sound effects in the Paramount production Spawn of the North holy shit this, they didn't even know what to do with special effects yet you know, they didn't even know how to categorize or what, what exactly it was and he just kind of seems to be this guy that we need to learn about because he 
paved the way for this. Like he keep he gets nominated over and over. Uh, Union Pacific, 1939, nominated for best effects. Typhoon, 1940, nominated for special effects. Uh, Doctor Cyclops, 1940, special effects. Doctor Cyclops. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Aloma of the South Seas, nominated for special effects. Uh, I Wanted Wings, 1941, winner for special effects. Reap the Wild Wind, 1942, winner for special effects. So Proudly We Hail, 1943, nominated for special effects. Uh, the Story of Dr. Wassel, 1944, nominated for special effects again. Uh, Technical Achievement Award in 1945 was given to him. <laughs> and then uh, in 1947, the film Unconquered is his last proper nomination. Uh, for special effects, and then he wins another honorary award in 1952. Just uh, holy shit! <laughs> it seemed it's, it seemed right to end on Mr. Gordon Jennings because this is this is the shit we love. We love seeing a guy who obviously is working in genre films and different kinds of weird shit, and is also winning awards. Like, uh, that, that's 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 a beautiful world right there. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah, that's awesome. I love pioneers, people who create, you know, the format that ends up becoming standard. It's so cool when that happens. But there's one super decorated Oscar person that you didn't mention. And that's costume designer Edith Head. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you're right. She is. She's she's massive. She's massive. I probably missed her when I was looking at Harry Horner and fucking John Meehan. Yeah. Edith Head won eight Oscars in her career. Crazy. (laughs) And was nominated, like, it looks at least 20 times. I'm going to go through these quickly. But Go ahead. I think they're worth talking about. Hell yeah. No, yeah, she's a legend. Her IMDb picture alone is worth a million (laughs) dollars. Well, she's well-dressed. Yeah, she's fantastic. (laughs) Well, yeah, and and it's she. she, you're going to hear movies that we've already talked about through all these. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 1948. The Emperor Waltz, Best Costume Design uh, nomination. 1949, winner, The Heiress, Best Costume Design. Uh, winner, 1949, Samson and Delilah, Best Co- Costume Design. Color, and then winner for Best Costume Design, Black and White, All About Eve. She won those at the same award. She won both costume designs that year. That's Ridiculous. Color and black and white. Ridiculous. <laughs> 1951, A Place in the Sun. 1952, The Greatest Show on Earth, and Carrie. 1953, winner, Roman Holiday. 1954, winner, Sabrina. 1955, The Catch a Thief, The Rose Tattoo. 1956, The Ten Commandments, and The Proud and Profane. 1957, Funny Face. 1958, The Buccaneer. 1959, The Five Pennies and Career. 1960, Pepe. 1960, winner, The Facts of Life. 1961, Pocket Full of Miracles. 1962, My Geisha and the Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. 1963. Crazy. Three nominations in 63. A New Kind of Love, Wives and Lovers, and Love with the Proper Stranger. 1964, What a Way to Go. And A House is Not a Home. 1965, Inside Daisy Clover and The Slender Thread. 1966, The Oscar. Perfect. I'm Perfect. tabbing that. I got to see what that is. 1969, Sweet Charity. 1970, Airport. Winner, 1973, The Sting. 1975, The Man Who Would Be King. And 1977, Airport 77. My God. <laughs> what Fantastic. An incredible run. The Oscar is literally a movie about an actor who becomes full of himself after he wins the, the Oscar for Best Actor. Like, it was up for two Oscars. We got to do this movie. <laughs> That sounds like California Sweet when Maggie Smith is being nominated. And she she won the actual Oscar in real life. Supporting, yeah, supporting role. That's really weird. That yeah, that's the, I gotta see that. I gotta see the predecessor. This cast is insane. Well, the Oscar, we'll table that. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that needs to be done on this show, obviously. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah. How could I forget Edith Head? Uh I, I, I'm probably forgetting a couple other people. I, I go through the IMDb and try to just look at people. She's yeah. a name. She's a name that we've we've seen a few times. So yeah, on the show, I just saw eight Oscars and I'm like, I I gotta say something. 
Yeah. I, no, I absolutely have to. I forgot Paul Giamatti on the Truman Show. Oh, yeah. Shit happens, you know. Sometimes I, you know, I sometimes I mistake uh, the Hepburns for being sisters for being sisters sometimes i forget legends like edith head <laughs> she is obviously the person that's good to end on gordon jennings and edith head that was fun lots of people we just talked about one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and twelve with edith head twelve individuals so oh. yeah that's yeah that that's it's crazy we're gonna try to skim through the 22nd academy awards here look at some stuff that the heiress won and was nominated for even though we've kind of been talking about it uh because i'm excited to get to our awards but uh let's uh let's start with let's see should we start with the four nominations and keep the four wins at the at the end yeah yeah i think that's a good way to go all right yeah that's probably that's probably right because it won some technical stuff and won some big stuff so you know yeah let's see here where to begin what's the proper Usually I look at what IMDb has it listed at, at the bottom, you know, best cinematography, black and white, I guess. That's probably, yeah, that's probably first one. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Best cinematography, black and white. I always hate how they used to separate them by black and white film and color film. It's so unnecessarily complicated. Kind of silly. Yeah. Uh, we have champion come to the stable, the heiress, Prince of Foxes, and the winner, Battleground, uh, which is a film I've heard about. I, that's one we might want to check out. Battleground, Paul C. Vogel, winner of cinematography. American war film that follows a company in the 327th Kilder Infantry Regiment. Yeah, yeah. I like, I, I like giving World War II movies a go. You know, you, sometimes you get a classic. Well, also, I admire, you know, World War II films made in the 40s when this war just fucking ended and it was still very yeah. fresh in people's heads. Way different perspective, yeah. yeah. Um, after that, we've got Best Director. Big jump there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got Robert Rawson for All the King's Men, William A. Wellman for Battleground, Carol Reed for The Fallen Idol, William Wyler for The Heiress, and the winner, Joseph L. Mankiewicz, for A Letter to Three Wives. We know Joseph Mankiewicz as the brother of renowned screenwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz. Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that, that's a, obviously a big name, uh, not just for one person, but for a family. So, yeah. Jo- Joseph, I love the picture they have of him with the fucking pipe. <laughs> he just, yeah, he just looks, looks like he means business, you know, and A Letter to the Three Wives is definitely a movie I've had on my list for a while uh you know all the king's men is obviously on our list because it's a fucking best picture winner so the the one here that i am kind of personally dying to see is uh the fallen idol directed by carol reed carol reed directed one of my favorite movies from this era the third man so i i I gotta try to check that out i i haven't really seen more of his work so i i need to need to do that maybe the fallen idol is a good place to start Oh, third man that's been on my list for a long time I, I really want to check that out yeah fucking cool ass movie yeah <laughs> best supporting actor john ireland in all the king's men arthur kennedy in champion ralph richardson in the heiress james whitmore in battleground and the winner dean jagger 12 o'clock high uh 12 o'clock high another war film gonna have to check out uh, yeah no 12 o'clock high is it also, it yeah, it looks like it also is a war. Yep, it is another World War II movie. That'd be fun to co- compare and contrast those two, you know. Yeah, just straight up 1949 World War II movies. Yeah, we're we're fresh out of being in that war. So holy shit. Yeah, I'm sure you know these films were made. A lot of it was probably you know post-war pep, like propaganda. Like we did it. We beat the Nazis and see what our troops did. This is what we did. So I'm sure it was a lot of that. That's why there were so many of them. But yeah, it doesn't make them yeah. bad movies. It's just, you know, what they were. And yeah, they can work and be something that you like really remember, like uh, from here to eternity, where it's, whoa, this, yeah. this is going to stay with me. And then you can, yeah, get some run of the mill redundant stuff. So you just got to be open minded. This has nothing to do with the heiress. I just thought this was funny. I'm looking at best screenplay here. And Joseph Mankiewicz wrote that he won for a letter to three wives. The novel is Letter to Five Wives. 
It's like he's he read Love it and it. was like five wives. That's too many wives. I can do three. Yeah. I don't have enough time for five. Yeah. <laughs> why why change it like that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh then we got best picture. Um uh, Battleground, The Heiress, A Letter to Three Wives, 12 O'Clock High, and the winner, All the King's Men. Uh, this is a year where I, I I haven't, I don't know anything about any of these films, apart from The Heiress, obviously, but it's a pretty uh, forgettable year, apparently. I wonder why. Yeah, I, yeah, I think these are the years where uh, sometimes you get a you know, you get like a 1939 where it has all these really recognizable titles and a lot of Oscar movies that are just still talked about today. And then, you know, uh, my eyebrows are usually more raised by something like this, where you see some titles that you haven't heard of uh, or you don't know much about, you know, like, like the fallen idol. I really want to see this, you know, uh, I didn't know that about letter of the three wives, letter, it's really letter of five wives, you know, those little things make you, just kind of nudge you, nudge you. And yeah. that's, you have to do that. Cause I also didn't think a whole lot of 1948 until I really dug in, you know, yeah. and who knows when we do a best picture showdown around, you know, these, who knows, maybe we'll love battleground. Maybe we'll love a letter of the three wives. You know, you, yeah. you just never know. It's you, you have to take that plunge to be rewarded. And that's all it takes for, for you and I is just, Give us a, a good sample size of, of these movies from this year and we'll kind of make our call from there. But as far, yeah, for both of us right here, it's pretty much just the errors, yeah. which is a good movie. It's, it's a, it's a good one to see first from this, from this group. Definitely. Uh, also the winner of best original song is baby. It's cold outside, which I didn't know was a movie song. So that's kind of neat. That's, <laughs> that's, that's great. I love, you could just scroll through these and like, just look at, best documentary feature there's only two really just two that's 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 all you could find and then documentary short subject there's two movies that win two shorts that win like what what's happening here why is everything so unconventional <laughs> one real and two real that's great yeah <laughs> good god fantastic so the heiress won best or scoring of a dramatic or comedy picture uh yeah all right <laughs> and um <laughs> Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Beyond the Forest by Max Steiner, Champion by Dimitri Tompkin, and The Heiress by Aaron Coplin. I've heard Dimitri Tompkin. We talked about this guy. Yeah. I don't know about Max Steiner, but yeah, I definitely recognize that. I recognize the Dimitri. Yeah. Well, it's a good score, as we t- as we said, so probably well deserved. Oh yeah. Awesome score. Love this one stands out from this era. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then we have Best Costume Design, Black and White. Two movies, The Heiress and Prince of Foxes. So The Heiress wins. Yeah, just literally no competition. You know, it's just one other film. So <laughs> can you imagine if that happened now? You know, <laughs> it'd be hilarious. <laughs> My God, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Best Art Direction, Black and White. Uh, come to the Stable. Madame Bovary and the heiress. Which one? Uh, just three. <laughs> just three, yeah. And then over here, we got Best Art Direction, Color. Three different movies. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, like we said, you know, the set design's really good in this film as well. Yeah, super good. It's, it's totally necessary when you're, when you're doing this kind of stuff. You're going to a different, a different era, even for the 40s, going to a different era, you know? Just like if we were make, if you and I were to make a movie about the '40s today, it would look a lot different than it does now, you know. And that's that's the name of the game with that category. And uh, I I remember recently when we talked about Howard's End, we both agreed that was the only thing we agreed on was that that was a strong point. Yeah. And usually the usually those honed in period pieces just flourish in the in this kind of a category. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Um, finally, we have. Best Actress, Leave it to Havlin. Yes. She was up against Jeanne Crane for Pinky, Susan Hayward for My Foolish Heart, Deborah Kerr for Edward, My Son, and Loretta Young for Come to the Stable. Uh, we talked about Deborah Kerr when we did From Here to Eternity. Yes, uh, yes, we did. And I don't think we've gotten to the rest of these actresses. Loretta Young sounds familiar. I may have seen something of hers in my Yeah, I, 
that's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress, The Farmer's Daughter, 1947. Huh. Yeah, maybe she has come up at some point. But yeah, mm-hmm. these are Olivia is so damn good. I would love to see the competition she beat. Uh, see if anybody even fucking holds a candle, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, and that are, that's that's the heiress at the Academy Awards, 22nd Oscars. It won the most. Uh, yeah. Before. Yeah, didn't didn't walk away with a big the big uh, you know best picture win, but it walked away with you know, four total awards, eight nominations. It's a movie that's remembered. Didn't do like great at the box office, uh, the heiress, but it stuck with critics, and it still kind of sticks with movie you know fucking cinephiles today. You know, it still sticks with people like us who just like a good good solid screenplay, good solid story, some twist, and uh, all at the center amazing performances with a backdrop that's perfect so the the heiress is awesome before we go into our awards you know i i was i I was really impressed i was really impressed uh this movie i gave four and a half stars in letterboxd i think it's a nine out of ten kind of movie i'm very much going to revisit it gonna try to show it to people i think it i think it's a film that can inspire people to watch other stuff from this era and I think that, that kind of hits hits the point that you were making at the very beginning of the show was that there, there's a reason that it's still kind of talked about amongst movie people the way it is. There's a, there's a reason there's a certain respect there. And it, when I was picking awards for it, I was like, Oh, this is, this is kind of why, you know, um, when those things are difficult, difficult to find a, a best line or best quote and a best scene, you know, the, that causes you to think oh, th- this movie must mean business. And the era certainly means business. Absolutely. Um, I love films that can still hold my attention that are 72 years old. That's amazing. Yep. <laughs> Is there, you know, yeah. there's movies back then that I think are terrible. There's movies today that I think are terrible. And I love finding gems like this. That I can say, you know, yes, I have seen The Heiress. It feels good to say that. Like, have you ever seen that movie? Yes, I have seen that movie. It feels good to say that. Yeah, yeah, I have seen that. Eight-time nominated, you know, for Oscar win, Olivia de Havilland fucking triumph. You know, yes, I have seen that, you know, and, and it's awesome. <laughs> That's even better when you're, like, passionate about it. You have something to say about it. You really care about it. And when that happens with these old movies, it gives you... The, the way you feel about, uh, as someone that's our age, that's in, in the middle of their 20s, the way we feel about, you know, the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s, we're starting to feel about the 40s and the 50s. We're yeah. finding, we're finding our, our niche. And that's huge. When you can look at a decade and say, these are my favorites from this decade. Years ago, I didn't even know anything about these movies. But these are my favorites now. You know, uh, The Great Dictator, you know, Monster Verdu, uh, right here, The Heiress, you know. Uh, fucking snake pit these movie gaslight these movies really matter when you look back at oh yeah i actually kind of have some favorites from this decade there's actually some really cool stuff yeah that's that's the best it's and it's it's constantly growing the more we do this show the more we learn the more we become you know full-fledged fucking cinephiles and it feels good every episode we do it's you know just I don't know what I'm trying to think of like a something I could compare it to. And I keep going back to like the mummy sucking the soul out of everyone. He gets like a kind of one of those jars from, but it's, I don't know. That's probably not the best thing to compare it to, but that's, that's, what it feels like. <laughs> that's, that's certainly what it feels like. Gives I'm you nearly that, completely gives you... regenerated here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm regenerated. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I love it. I love it, man. And I very much looking forward to, to what you have here, to what you have here for what stood out to you in the heiress. Uh, so we'll get, we'll get down to it. We got the Tarantino for best quote, best line. We got the Ennio Morricone award for best music moment. We got the Philip Seymour Hoffman award for best performance of the movie. And we got the Roger Deakins award for the best scene of the film. So what, what, what do you got to say? What's the best line from this awesome screenplay? Uh, this line comes uh, towards the like beginning of the of the final act. It's when um, 
the good Dr. Sloper is trying to explain to Catherine, like, it was for your own good. You should be happy he left you. And she says something that I thought cut pretty deep, which was, uh, don't be kind to me. It doesn't become you. Yeah, God. (laughs) So good. She came to she came to play. (laughs) Oh, man. I love love that line. And, and, you know, I got to mention that her father's name is Austin. How (laughs) weird is that? That's so weird to hear. You don't hear that name very much pre like 80s. Yeah, I was I was like, huh, weird. Yeah, thought it was real weird. This this older gentleman, you know, this father, uh, older father figure is just name is Austin. Of course, that's my name, but it's not so much that it was my name that I was taken back by. I was just like, wait, I don't think I've ever seen a character named Austin in the fucking (laughs) forties. I don't think that's ever happened. (laughs) Yeah. It caught me off guard too. (laughs) Cause, cause the city of Austin doesn't really take off till much later. And that's when people started using that as a name, you know, this becomes a really popular city. And it makes sense that people in my generation are named Austin, someone who's born in the 90s when Austin was fucking thriving, you know, and was like the coolest place uh, to visit in the South was, I don't think that's uh, the case for everybody anymore, but there was a time when the city was very, very cool, you know, very hip and was still kind of fucking underground, you know, Uh, but 1949, (laughs) not so much. I just thought that was fascinating, but he has some they have some killer lines together. They have some moments together where it's like, dude, these two, you know, it's fucking the apprentice. You know? <laughs> He's fucking trying to make her just as evil as he is. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, you, you feel gray about it. It's not black and white. You're, you're not like, oh, this guy's, yeah, he's a dick, but he's right. You know, yeah. he's, a, he's a right dick. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and she, you know, goes through her shit, but uh, they ended up being, they ended up being correct about it. You know, their assumptions were true. I, yeah, I thought it was fascinating. I, I love that. I almost wrote that one down that, that line, but uh, I, I chose, I chose something that just kind of just dug under my skin, same kind of tone as what you picked. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit of banter between, between Austin and Catherine. And he says, ah, you have found a tongue at last, Catherine. Tis only to say such terrible things to me. Yes, this is a field where you will not compare to me, my mother. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> That's actually crazy, man. One of my few gripes about this film is we never really get any resolution between Austin's like obsession with his dead wife. We never yeah. get this like, you know, any uh, development on like where that came from. And he never... Well, maybe that's, you know, we, we don't get that rec- that reconciliation because it becomes Catherine's movie and she says no. So maybe yes. that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that has a lot to do with it is he clearly has this healing to do about yeah. about about the person he loved, you know. And so when she's brought up, it's it's almost like fucking Voldemort. It's like, wait a minute. No, like, don't you can't you can't use that. You can't use that shit, you know, <laughs> and. They, they just kind of go at each other's throats sometimes. Uh, and then they're also in agreement at, <laughs> somehow in some way at times. So it's, it's fantastic. There's a lot of really cool kind of conniving lines in the screenplay that I love. Mm-hmm. I love. I love when a movie does it now, but especially in the forties when it, you know, you, you have your things, you, your hoops that you have to go around. I love when a screenplay is still really gritty. Yeah. When they can't swear. So they have to figure out a creative way to say you bastard. <laughs> yeah i i think i think i think it, cre- it creates a, a dilemma but then it also creates opportunity to be even more creative you know there's there's one line i there's one line i love from uh mrs montgomery uh when she comes in she says i think doctor that you expect too much of people if you do you'll always be disappointed you know these these are like fundamental type quotes type lines when you're writing them down you're like oh yeah that's relatable to a lot of people you know it's something if it's said correctly, it can be powerful. And this movie has a bunch of those. Yeah, it's definitely, there's, there's a lot of life lessons to be had from this film. Uh, I had from one of my um, quotes I had written down was, um, it was right when uh, 
Dr. Austin is trying to, I had a dentist named Dr. Austin back in the day. So it just feels natural to say that. Nice. <laughs> he, um, she's trying to convince him, like he loves me. And, she, and he basically says like, why? Like for what? <laughs> like You have no qualities. Like the cruelest thing he can say is just like, no one will love you because there's nothing to love. Like, holy fuck, man. I mean, yeah, I get that you don't want this guy to go after her money, but do you have to completely destroy her as a human being in the process? Yeah, man. Fucking ridiculous. God, God, he he has another one. But I was just scrolling through here, looking at some of the quotes on IMDb because they're fucking awesome. Uh, when he's talking to Elizabeth Austin, he's like, you're not entitled to say that. Only I know what I lost when she died and what I got in her place. Holy fuck. Jesus. <laughs> Ugh. This yeah, this 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 movie is worth uh, revisiting, if only to kind of catch more of those little things where he's mentioning what's what's behind him in his life. You know, oh, crazy! <laughs> it reminds me of fucking Denethor from Lord of the Rings with Faramir. Just like you know, I that will depend on the matter of your return. Like just Ugh. absolute. Like I despise you because of what you represent. Like oh. Such hatred, such pain. Yeah. For your own Ugh. child. <laughs> Jeez, man. Yeah. God, movies have, have the power. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> they have the power, especially when you write correctly and then get people to fucking knock it out of the park like in this movie. Um, the Ennio. We're going to take it back to Aaron Copland, the composer. <laughs> the Ennio Morricone. A really tough award. Always, always a lot of fun to see where we uh, differentiate. And uh, I think this is the one where we uh, we rarely pick the same thing. We're always kind of looking yeah. at different things within the score, within the soundtrack. So what do you got? Before I say my NEO, I do want to just mention that I cannot believe this film was not nominated for screenplay. Yeah, ridiculous. Unbelievable. That's one uh, of the things that critics at the time and now were yeah. obsessed with. Mm -hmm. um, so my moment comes from a beautiful hybrid score moment where Catherine has just told Austin about the engagement and she is like completely in love. And he is absolutely devastated because he believes this to be Tom Fuldery. And so the music is uplifting for her and like completely devastating, like a death for him. And to play those at the same time and have it work is fucking bananas. So yeah, I had to go with that. Ah, so good. I, I, I know exactly what you speak of. Like what, what moment you're talking about is super powerful. The score does that a few times where it's contrasting. Yeah. And that's so rare to find in, in any movie where the score is really that, that captivating. It, has, it usually has to be so unique. And, and that's, that's the case with the heiress. Uh, I, I chose a similar bit where things are happening differently. It's like an hour and a half in to the movie. Catherine confronts her father and basically is like, fucking disinherit me then, bitch. You know, it's, it's so <laughs> awesome. It's so awesome. So cool. And the music's so goddamn intense. And you you feel it kind of warping. You know, I I I love that. But I, I remember a lot of moments. Uh, I, this is a score that I wish I could just buy, you know. <laughs> like I, I would love to just have it on vinyl or something. It's it's really cool, really cool stuff. And Aaron Copeland's got my attention. I fucking love when she plays straight up chicken with her inheritance, just goes and gets the paper, starts writing it down. And he, she's like, do you want, how do you want it to be phrased? I want to get this right. And he's like, no, I don't want to do it. Like he, she calls him on it. It's, when she actually like starts growing a pair, it becomes a fucking completely different movie. I love it. Yep. Oh yeah. When she decides, Oh, I, I need to take control of what's happening. Yeah. 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 It, get, it gets so good. And Olivia just kicks it into high gear. Yeah. Straight up. Ah, oh, fantastic. Great stuff. Which which leads us to the, the Philip Seymour Hoffman Award here. Uh, this is probably the one where we uh, agree the most, right? This is the one where, I mean, I, I know there's fundamental times where we can really point at something. No, we, we totally disagreed. Yeah. But I think this is the one where we've, we've had the most, like last week. Yeah, it's Chaplin. Come on, you know. Yeah. But this one, this one's up for debate. This one's up for debate. Montgomery Clift is unbelievable. Ralph Richardson's unbelievable. And I, I think I think I, and Olivia would finish those three. 
I don't have an argument. So uh, who do you got? I have Ralph Richardson. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> yeah, I figured. And it's specifically because his character is so gray. He's not just a hateful father. He's a hateful father who's actively trying to do the right thing here. He is trying to protect his family's money from vultures. But the way he goes about it is so cruel and so unnecessarily cruel. Like he destroys his daughter's confidence and their relationship just so this bastard doesn't get a dime. But he plays it with such sympathy at times. Like you, you, there's a thing in Ralph Richardson's eyes where you can see this, like, I wish I didn't have to do this look. And he never fesses up. Like the moment he wants to is on his deathbed. And Catherine says, fuck that guy. Like, no, he had his chance. And I just, I wanted so badly to know what, what did he want to say? I, I was really enthralled by Ralph Richardson and I didn't expect to be. Yeah. That, that always, that, that, that's always awesome. Right. It kind of catapults that person because you, you go into it knowing, okay, Olivia won this, this Academy award. She's awesome. You already know she's awesome from the snake pit. You don't, you don't need to be proved anything <laughs> by yeah. Olivia. She's, she's already got the respect. Yeah. But when Ralph, someone like Ralph comes in and just kind of steals the show, I totally get it. Uh, I ended up choosing Olivia for the PSH, but God, by a hair. I think Montgomery Clift also just ha- is knocking on the door. I think he's like, he's so good in this. And I think when you rewatch it, when we both find time to rewatch it one day, I think we're both going to be kind of more in love with the film and more in love with the performances specifically. Cause it's, it's just a whole different thing when you know what happens at the end, <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, it's fucking fucking awesome. So cool. Uh, all three of those people are are fantastic. Can't go wrong with any of them winning the PSH. But I got to give it to you, Ralph Richardson. He kind of embodies what PSH, you know, was all about. It's like I will steal the show no matter how much time you give me. So R- Ralph really fits the bill for PSH. <laughs> he really does. But uh, I got to go, Olivia. She's the woman of the hour and. She is so damn good, and and I'm I'm so happy we chose this movie. So happy. I totally get you picking Olivia. She really, I love her turn from you know naive young woman in love to just angry, bitter, like old maid almost. But you get it. I mean, if my heart was broken like that, I'd never love again either. Yeah, yeah, and my my Deacons has a lot to do with why I kind of she just she. she goes through the roof on, on my favorite scene. And I, I'll but never also, forget it. Like Montgomery Cliff, there is an argument for him to take it too, because you kind of don't know if he's the bad guy. The first time yeah. you're watching this, you don't know. You think like this kid could be genuine because he plays such a great con man. And in the end, when you find when you finally do realize like, yeah, he was full of shit the whole time. You notice little things in his performance that are so like subtle, but strong, like the way he disrespects, uh, Austin's decanter and his cigars, like just you know throwing shit around. Like he ha- he clearly has no respect for their property, and you can't teach that respect. That's a respect that he just doesn't have, and that's kind of a hint that he doesn't respect her either. Yeah, it's, yeah, so good. Fucking fucking awesome, man. Love it, love it. I can tell we both uh we're both gonna watch this movie again one day. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. Uh, the Deacons, the Roger Deacons. Uh, you know, we got to talk about Leo Tover today, cinematographer, but it's safe to say that our, our favorite cinematographer is, uh, is uh, uh, as far as for both of us, is Roger Deacons. You know, uh, there's guys I love out there, but Deacons is a guy who's won and been nominated over and over. And I also love his work, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's that's why this, this the best scene, that's why we named it Roger Deacons. And I'm very curious to hear what you got here. I had the scene where uh, Catherine and Austin finally come to blows. I love that scene. But so then good. at the end, when Morris shows up again, oh. that, that was it. <laughs> because I was screaming at the TV, like, don't fucking buy it, Catherine. Don't do it. And you think that she's going to be like, you know, her, the way she starts kind of like swooning again, 
you think, yeah. fuck, he did it. He he bought her. But then when she when he leaves, she tells them, like, he said the same old shit he used to say. Like, he's yes. the same lies, the same bullshit. And yeah. I was cheering. I'm like, yes. And then she just bolted the door. And he's just, like, screaming, like, let me in, please. And she just goes to bed. It's so powerful, so subtle, but so such a great message of just, I'm not falling for it again, asshole. Like, you had me once, you know, fool me once, shame on me, or you, fool me twice, shame on me. It was such a great moment. And just in that moment when um, Clift is talking to her, you can, like, there's a bit at the beginning we can see in her eyes where she's like, really? You're gonna, you're, after all this time, you're gonna do this again? Like, in her eyes. And she, she, you can tell that she has this moment of like, eh, let's play along. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's so cool. And it's so great from both of them. And it was just my favorite part of the movie. Yeah, same. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote down the finale between Catherine Morris and her aunt. Open quote. He came back with the same lies, the same silly little phrases. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the be- that's the best part of the movie. Her face turns from person to like demon to like sinister. Fuck this guy, and it's awesome. It's also. Uh, a, a rarity in this era where the female character is totally empowered. Yeah. And he's like, fuck you. You know, it's just two fat middle fingers right to fucking Montgomery Cliff's face, you know, which had to be great for her because they didn't get along on set, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that had to be great. And Montgomery Cliff banging on the door, just that. And then seeing the end is like, holy fuck, this is why I watch movies. This is why I do it. This is why I come back over and over. <laughs> This is why I call myself, you know, you did this before. Uh, this is a nickname you have to give yourself when you're crazy like us. We're Hollywood's bitches. You know, this is, <laughs> this is why we come crawling back. Stuff like this. The finale of this movie is unforgettable. And again, this movie is, I see a lot of stuff in it, a lot of the tropes. I see it in movies that I liked today. I see it in movies that I've liked the past, you know, 20 years where it, the tone and that, that commitment to being one movie and turning to another is one of my favorite, favorite things that anything can do. Any piece of art can do is just turn like that and actually keep your attention and actually make sense. I, I love it. I love every decision this movie makes. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I like it. And the more I think about that scene, the more I kind of get like a weird nasty grin on my face because i'm like i i love when a, I love especially when a female character is just i'm done I'm not having it you're stupid you can't like, like you said you can't you can't fool me twice you know that's not happening and that is one of the coolest things in in in, in storytelling and especially in movies when you get that kind of weird satisfaction the credits start rolling and you're like yeah okay I feel kind of dirty, but I, but I like it. <laughs> and that's, that's what the, the heiress gave me. You know, I was, I was very, very happy with the viewing I had of it, picking out the awards and just kind of learning about what caused it to be what it is. Um, really, really, really cool. Really, really fun. Sometimes we don't know when we're shooting in the dark and it, it, it fucking worked here on episode 62. Straight up. The rest of our forties uh, run is all shots in the dark. And, uh, I'm excited. Yeah. This was uh, an eight out of 10 for me. Uh, three and a half on letterbox. That's usually an eight for me. And yeah. uh, it three is a strong, four. Yeah. yeah, it's a strong movie. The performances are great. It's a bit of a slow starter, but once it gets going, it really does not stop. And I appreciate a film that event, you know, so many movies never get going. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, pull, like pull starting a lawnmower, but it never fucking turns on. But sometimes, you know, we get these. And I'm, like you said, this is something I'm going to check out again for sure. Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with that being said, uh, you just you just mentioned how uh, the rest of our 40s runner movies we've heard of, but are, you know, we don't know. We don't know what we're going into. We don't have any idea what we're going to be picking for the awards and whatnot. And next week is super special because we get to marry our knowledge of somebody and our passion for somebody with a new first time watch. So, you know, when we, when we did the fifties before, before the nineties, we, we visited this guy on our one year anniversary of this show. We talked about rear window 
1954. So yeah, you, you probably know who we're, who we're going to be talking about. It's Mr. Hitchcock, uh, a film we both haven't seen, which is, you know, that's, that's not easy to do with Hitchcock. He's got a lot of awesome classic movies. Uh, it's 1945's Spellbound, which can be found in its entirety on YouTube. Thank God. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's a very hard movie to get a hold of. Yeah. Uh, just like the heiress, it's kind of hard to, to actually get your hands on. So we f- we wanted to do this movie bad. We kind of had this, we got it. We got to revisit Hitchcock for the forties. We got to kind of continue that momentum and, and do another, do another one of his movies. And Spellbound was just kind of speaking to us because we haven't talked, we haven't talked about 1945 at all uh, on Oscar Sunday. And we want to do Hitchcock again. So it just made sense to just kind of marry what we're doing. First time watch with a guy that we know and we love bringing up. So come back next week for episode 63 uh, on 1945 spellbound can't wait can't wait for that but we got we got big stuff coming on uh sneak preview and uh really cool film guys and episode coming up so i'll let you talk about that yeah tomorrow's sneak preview is going to be talking about you know the big movie of the weekend the suicide squad james gunn's dc movie that has apparently changed the definition of success for dc so i'm excited i'm seeing it tomorrow uh or actually no wait I'm, I saw it yesterday. I hope it was good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, and then Wednesday's Filmgasm, we're doing the 2016 home invasion thriller Don't Breathe in preparation for the release of Don't Breathe 2 next weekend. So looking forward to that. It's been a minute since I saw that. And uh, I'm just, I love this whole fucking thing. <laughs> it's Movies, movies, movies. It's everything. It's awesome. It's the best. Yeah, it's, it's nonstop. It's nonstop. Don't breathe. It's so awesome. Super excited to see the second one. Uh, just, just so fucking weird and so so committed to being, you know, kind of individually weird and sticking to its guns no matter what. I have a lot of respect for that first movie. Very excited to see, to see the second one and can't wait to hear you and Josh on Filmgasm. It's going to be fun. Straight up. Hope you enjoyed our look into the heiress. Uh, if you want to watch it, good luck. Uh, yeah. You're, you're going to have to, like, to... Or, you, I, I got it online. I just got it on criterion.com because I couldn't, I didn't know. I didn't want to wait or like find it anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got really lucky and stumbled onto it for seven bucks at my local half price books, but you can get it on DVD on Amazon. If you want, uh, it's going to, it's going to cost you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, honestly, archive.org may have it they have so many old movies that might be your best bet if you want to watch this there you go thanks for sharing Mm -hmm. that's where i find a lot i found a great documentary on uh rocky erickson and the 13th floor elevators on archive.org very hard to get a hold of so i love that website hell yeah uh yeah thanks for listening see you next week